For this Bernoulli equation and continuity equation fluid mechanics example problem, we've got one inlet pipe that branches out into three outlet pipes, and we've got a hodgepodge assortment of different information for each branch of the pipe. And we're trying to find a similar hodgepodge of information, something for each outlet. May have been a mistake though for me to locate my YouTube studio inside your TA Indiana and Serenity's playroom. And we'll see how long they can be patient before they demand I take a break and go play with them. So we're given that the working fluid for this system is water and that you can ignore viscous effects. Using all of the information given in the figure, we're trying to find velocity through outlet two, pressure through outlet three, and then the volumetric flow rate through outlet four. So the Bernoulli equation is used for two different points along the same streamline. So a streamline means, imagine you had a single molecule of water. Would that molecule actually be able to reach from point A to point B? If so, then they're on the same streamline and you can potentially use Bernoulli's equation. So for this problem, since all three outlets are directly connected to the same inlet, you can use Bernoulli's equation to compare the inlet to all three of the outlets. But looking ahead, I can also see that in order to find the flow rate through section four, I'm also gonna need to use the continuity equation. Continuity equation is the fancy fluid mechanics way of saying conservation of mass. So in making assumptions for this problem, whenever you're using the Bernoulli equation, there's a standard set of four assumptions that always have to apply. One, we were already given that viscous forces could be negligible. One, we drew right on the picture to show that each of these three paths all fall on the same streamline. And the other two assumptions are that your fluid is incompressible and that you have steady flow. Incompressible fluid is required because density or specific weight is part of the Bernoulli equation. And so if that value is not constant, then that's gonna mess up the equation. So density has to be constant. And this can be assumed to apply for basically all liquids. And surprisingly, you can even use that assumption for gases. And that seems really strange because of course gases are compressible. Think of an air compressor, right? That's what you use to say, fill up your car tires. But as long as the gas of air is moving at a relatively low speed, and as a rule of thumb, we'll say, Mach 0.3 or around 200 miles an hour. If your gas is moving at less than 200 miles per hour, go ahead and assume that it's incompressible. Maybe, maybe some other video will explain why that's the case, but it usually is and it'll lead to errors only maybe 1% as long as the speed is slow. Now steady flow means that the velocity at each point has to be constant. This does not mean that the velocity at every point has to say, be the same as every other point, just that the velocity at one point is not changing. Suppose this system had a pump and right when it turned on, it takes a little while to ramp up to speed. In that case, you could not use the Bernoulli equation during this transitory transition period while the pump is speeding up. But once the pump has reached steady state and then your system is moving at a more constant flow rate, that's where you get this steady state or steady flow assumption. So let's just go in order, point two, three, and four. So the left-hand side will be all of the point one terms and the right-hand side all of the point two terms. So the Bernoulli equation can be thought of as a conservation of energy but looking only at energy that is stored as pressure, velocity, or gravitational elevation. If you have energy changing in the form of temperature or energy being added by a pump or removed by a turbine or energy loss due to friction, you're gonna to need to use a different version, an energy equation, which we'll get to later on in this course. And if you wanna watch a video on that, you can see one right up here. But for now, from point one to point two on this problem, we're only exchanging pressure, velocity, and elevation. There are several versions of the Bernoulli equation, depending on what type of units you wanna work with. I'm gonna go ahead and write the head version of this equation, which has all of the units in terms of distance. In this problem, feet. In your fluid mechanics course, when you hear the word head, think feet or meters, it's elevation. Even though sometimes it's used to represent a quantity like pressure, pressure head, we're just manipulating the units to turn pressure into elevations of feet. And we get that by dividing by specific weight of the fluid. For velocity, V squared divided by two G is also gonna have terms of feet. And then the elevation term is just Z, it's just height. Now, if we wanted the pressure version of Bernoulli's equation, we just multiply all three of these terms by specific weight. We would get pressure on one side. And since specific weight is rho g, the middle term g would cancel and we would get rho v squared over two. And then the third term in the equation would be rho gh or rho gz in this case. And all three terms would be in terms of pressure. Now, this problem didn't actually contain any information about height though. 
So let's make an assumption here that this is a top-down view of the system. So it actually all points one, two, three, and four are all at the same elevation. This is just gonna let me cross off the Z terms. With that, I can start to plug in some terms. I've got 10 PSI for pressure. And I'm gonna have to do a unit conversion because PSI, pounds per square inch, that's not gonna match the velocities that I'm given or the areas that I'm given for the cross sections, which are all in feet. So I multiply by 144 inches squared per feet squared to turn this pressure into pounds per square foot. We weren't given any information about the temperature of this system. So let's go ahead and assume 62.4 pounds per cubic foot, which is a, a typical specific weight of water at about room temperature. We weren't given velocity 0.1, so that's something we'll actually have to solve for using the given flow rate and area. All right, so the relationship between velocity, area, and volumetric flow rate. So we've got water flowing through a one square foot area of pipe, and it's flowing at 10 feet per second. After one second has passed, that cross section of area has moved a distance of 10 feet. This has created essentially a cylindrical slug of water that is 10 feet long and has a cross sectional area of one square foot. And that represents the volume of water that has passed through the inlet in a time period of one second. And that's volumetric flow rate. What volume of water passes through a given cross-sectional area in a given period of time. So rearranging to V equals Q over A, we can find a velocity of 10 feet per second through the beginning inlet of this pipe. Divide by 2G, where G is 32.2 feet per second squared, not 9.81, which is used for metric units only. We can plug in pressure on the right-hand side and again have to convert from PSI to pounds per square foot. V2 is the only unknown, little bit of calculator work. We get 29.03 feet per second as the velocity through 0.2. Now this is almost three times as fast as the water was going through 0.1. Does that make sense? Should it have gotten faster or should it have been slower? So think conservation of energy. We've got energy stored in three forms, pressure, velocity, height. The height energy is exactly the same. We made that assumption. So now we've got energy as stored as pressure and velocity. Since the pressure went down from point one to point two, that means that energy had to go somewhere, means velocity had to go up. So a velocity two greater than 10 does make sense. Next part, find pressure point three. Start out by writing Bernoulli's equation again. I'm gonna go ahead and stick with the head form. It worked fine for us the first part of the problem. Still keeping the same assumption that elevations are the same, so I'll cross off all the Z terms. And I don't have to redo all the calculator work, 23.08 and 1.55 on the left-hand side. Over on the right-hand side, we were given velocity of 20 feet per second, and we need to find pressure. Now I was lazy and didn't actually write down my units for this problem, but I get a pressure of 1149 pounds per feet squared. If you're lazy like me, the most common student mistake I would expect on this problem is just to write PSI next to this 1149 and box it and call it good and move on. But remember, the 62.4 is pounds per cubic foot, and the velocity was 20 feet per second. We also might be able to recognize the mistake because 1149 is way bigger than the original 10 PSI at 0.1. So dividing by 144 inches squared per feet squared, gets us to 7.98 PSI. And again, we should be able to check whether the answer makes sense. Should pressure have gone up or gone down? So velocity at point one was 10, at point two is 20. So some energy was converted into velocity energy. So velocity energy went up, then pressure energy must have gone down. So the final answer has to be less than 10 PSI less than the pressure point one. So that's another way that you could catch your mistake if you thought that 1149 was the final answer. You should know that the final answer has to be less than 10. Pressure has to be decreasing in order for velocity to speed up. On to part three, find the flow rate through outlet number four. And for this problem, we're not given anything. Pressure, velocity, nothing. And that's the clue that we're not gonna be able to use Bernoulli's equation for this. We've got two unknowns since we don't know pressure or velocity. But since we know information about every other branch of the system, we should be able to use the continuity equation, which is a version of conservation of mass. The fluid mechanics continuity equation is related to the, the energy equation, the momentum equation, all through the Reynolds transport theorem. And I don't think I wanna go into the full Reynolds transport theorem for this problem. Instead, I'll just say that most of it does not apply in this case. Since we have steady flow of an incompressible fluid, there's no accumulation happening. That is, the amount of water that's in the control volume of the center of this pipe is not changing. It's not increasing or decreasing because that section of the pipe is not filling up or emptying. 
So if we look at this entire cross section of pipe as a control volume with one inlet and four outlets, the Reynolds transport theorem simplifies down to the amount of mass that crosses into the system has to equal the amount of mass leaving the system. Mass in equals mass out. That is conservation of mass or the continuity equation. And if mass in equals mass out, if you divide both sides by density, you can get that volume in equals volume out since density is not changing, it's incompressible. Take the derivative of both sides. If volume in equals volume out, then the rate of change of volume in equals the rate of change of volume out. That's Q in equals Q out, where Q is V dot. It's the rate of change. Since we've got one inlet and three outlets, we've got Q1 equals Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4. And rearrange to solve for Q4 is equal to Q1 minus Q2 minus Q3. So we're given flow rate at one, that's that 10 cubic feet per second. We are given both of the cross-sectional areas for points two and three, and either given or have already found those two velocities. So we plug in all the numbers, do some calculator work, 3.968 cubic feet per second is the volumetric flow rate through point four, where when combined with the four and the 2.03, means that all three outlets add up to 10. There's 10 cubic feet per second entering the system, 10 cubic feet per second exiting the system. So this is one of the easier versions of a continuity equation problem that you can find in this class. If you're ready to move on to a slightly harder version, watch this video next, which has you solve for the amount of time it will take for a tank to drain empty. It's also gonna use Bernoulli equation and continuity equation, but what makes it more complicated is that over time, the height of the tank changes. And that means it's gonna take calculus and integrals in order to solve. So watch this video, so if you see a harder problem like this on a homework or a test, you'll be better prepared since you've seen it before. 